Sterling Memorial Library. My name is Michael Printy. I'm the librarian for Western European Humanities. And I'd like to welcome you to the first Arts and Humanities book talk of this year. And this one is co-sponsored by the Yale University Press and by the Macmillan Center. And before I uh, introduce our, our speakers and our talk, uh, our next talk is on October 29th at 4.30. And that book is City Unseen, New Visions of an Urban Planet, which is also a Yale Press book by professors by Professor Karen Sido and Meredith Reba, both at Yale University. Uh, today's event will be moderated by William Frucht, who is an executive editor at the Yale University Press. And, um, and I would like to introduce the, the two authors. Uh, Francis Rosenbluth and Ian Shapiro are both professors of political science here at Yale. And the title of the book is Responsible Parties, Saving Democracy from Itself. And then it's the Yale University Press, 2018. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Bill, who will conduct the rest of the event. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking the Sterling Library for hosting us uh, and the Whitney and Betty McMillan Center for International and Area Studies for sponsoring this discussion, um, especially uh, Mike Printy at Sterling Library, uh, Marilyn Wilkes at the McMillan Center, and Jennifer Dorr at Yale University Press for help in organizing this event. The format tonight is this. I'll give a brief introduction, then Professors Rosenbluth and Shapiro will each speak for a few minutes, after which we'll have a conversation about their new book, Responsible Parties. You're invited to raise your hand and ask a question at any time after the author's initial statements are finished, but please observe two rules. First, we have limited time, so keep your questions brief. Second, while opinions are welcome, we're following the Alex Trebek rule, Please state your answer in the form of a question. <laughs> Francis Rosenbluth is the Damon Wells Professor of Political Science here at Yale, as well as the Director of the Program on Ethics, Politics, and Economics. She was Deputy Provost for Social Sciences and Faculty Development from 2008 to 2013. Her most recent books are Forged Through Fire, Military Conflict and the Democratic Bargain, co-authored with John Farajan, Women, Work, and Politics, co-authored with Torben Iverson, and Japan Transformed, co-authored with Michael Tice. Ian Shapiro is Sterling Professor of Political Science as well as Director of the Macmillan Center. He's taught at Yale since 1984 and was Chair of the Political Science Department from 1999 to 2004. His many books include Pathologies of Rational Choice Theory, co-authored with Donald Green, The Moral Foundations of Politics, The Real World of Democratic Theory, the flight from reality in the human sciences, and most recently, politics against the not, uh, sorry, politics against domination. I'm an editor at Yale University Press, and those of you who've heard my rants know that I have essentially two criteria for judging books, besides that they be well written. First, they have to take on some important question, and second, they have to try to change the way we think about the world. Artemis Ward once wrote, it isn't what we don't know that gets us into trouble, it's all the things we know that ain't so. And the question I always ask my authors is, what does everybody know about your subject that ain't so? In other words, how do you want to change the conventional wisdom about your subject, and why does it matter? Often these are things I have to tease out of a proposal, sometimes they aren't there at all. With Francis and Ian's book, the counterintuitive quality is hard to miss. The decentralization of political power is almost universally seen as a remedy for the problems of democratic government. If people are discontented with slow economic growth, income inequality, failed wars, or corruption, then give them more of a say in government, goes the argument, and they'll give us governments that truly serve the interests of the people. In recent decades, we've tried to increase public participation through popular referendums, greater use of party primaries, and in some places, proportional representation as a way to elect honest outsiders to come in and drain the swamp. We are seeing how well this is working. Responsible Parties asks us to consider that perhaps what is universally put forward as the solution to democracy's failings is in fact part of the problem. And with that, I'd like to introduce Francis Rosenbluth and Ian Shapiro. Thank you. 
hooked up. Um, you have to turn it on. No, it is on. Yep. Um, well, thank you so much, Bill, for that great introduction. And thank you all for coming to join us in this conversation. We really do want to converse with you. And so we're, our remarks are going to be very short. But we are going to try to give you our argument so that you can perhaps argue back or improve the way we are thinking about this. So all of us know, and I think we begin with the recognition that voters are unhappy. Certainly in the United States, we have a lot to be unhappy with. And there is a whole bunch of books about the collapse of democracy and the rise of fascism and where should we escape from Trumpistan and on and on. And we agree with all of that, but we have a, I guess Bill said it best, a slightly contrarian view of what we should do in response to the problems at hand. Uh, so rather than what we call do-it-yourself politics, decentralization, democratization, pulling power back from these nasty elites who've gotten us into all this trouble, we're actually making an argument in favor of restoring power to political parties that are able to and forced to by dint of competition with one another think about what is good for most of the people over the long term. Political parties are in the business of establishing a long-term reputation for competence. And so instead of referendums, which give voters the ability to pick apart policies one by one, we're suggesting that we exactly want parties to bundle issues in such a way that the costs of every policy are measured against every other policy. So think about. Proposition 13. How many of you were even born in 1978? Some of you remember Proposition 13. It seemed like a really great idea at the time. It was a popular referendum in California to reduce taxes. What could be better? And voters came out and supported this proposition to reduce taxes. Now, unfortunately, when you look at one issue at a time, you don't consider the fact that you have now removed from the state government a whole bunch of revenue from the property taxes for schools, which citizens of California also cared about. But that was not on the table at the time. Those issues were not bundled. And therefore, they got low taxes and poor schools. So political parties are, we argue, a central organ, maybe the central organ of democratic accountability because it is parties that do this work for us and that must compete against one another to put forward the best possible argument that most voters will prefer. And I'm going to turn it over to Ian to say more, especially about um, particular examples of when there have been failures, but also how do we do this? You know, if we want responsible parties, how actually do we get responsible parties, especially in a country like the United States that is designed to put barriers in the way of too much concentration of power? We are not set up for that. We have a president. We have two bodies of Congress that often are controlled by different parties. We have federalism that reserve rights for states. How would we get parties that are able to function in this institutional environment to be able to deliver in the kind of way that we're talking about. So I will turn it over. OK, thank you, Francis. I was gratified to see that Bill was introduced as the moderator. I think when two co-workers need a moderator, uh, that, that that's probably a thing. But as, as it turned out, we had surprisingly easy time working together on this book. Um, I would like to, to give uh, a couple of, uh, a little bit of elaboration uh, about what Francis, with respect to what Francis said about two parties, and then a couple of examples uh, of things that are 
a lie that, that are actually aggressive. Uh, I'm a political theorist by training, and I'm acutely aware of the story of the fellow who went up to a farmer in Donegal and said, how do we get to Dublin? And the answer came back, well, I wouldn't start from here, son. Uh, so we, we are very, uh, we're very much in, in this book trying to make recommendations which are informed by a general idea about parties, but we, we, very, we want to start from where we are. Um, so the, the main thing about the book is that it's important to have two and only two parties, and it's important that the parties be strong, uh, able to manage themselves internally. Now you might say, why two and only two? Many people like PR, where you get lots of parties, because then the Greens can have their representative in Parliament, the pro Labour people can have their representative in Parliament, everybody can get, get their representation. But one of the things that happens with uh, coalition, with lots of parties, is you have to form coalitions. And nobody knows who's going to be in a coalition ahead of time. So another way of thinking about this is that um, two, two party systems are, are, parties are more like marriages. Occasionally they're divorces, but basically they're put together for the long run. Whereas coalition governments are more like hookups. Uh, this is working for us now, but who knows the next election, what the next election is going to bring. So most recently, Angela Merkel would spend many months trying to put together a coalition with the Free Democrats and the Greens in Germany, um, couldn't do it, and so went back to a grand coalition with SPD. Or in Greece in the last election, we got a coalition with the far left and the far right. Who knows what's going to be happening next time? And so this is an, illustrates why um, you need uh, parties that can build a brand and, and campaign into the future, and as Francis was saying, have a reputation for competence uh, at, at implementing um, their agenda. Just in that one more analogy is in industrial negotiations, sometimes when uh, they can't agree, they go to arbitration. They bring in an arbitrator, and um, the arbitrator listens to both sides, does some fact-finding, and usually picks some compromise solution. But there's another kind of arbitration, which is called last best offer arbitration, where both sides have to make their last best offer, and the arbitrator has to pick one. And that, the effect of that is to, to force the parties to not be unreasonable, not to take positions for strategic reasons to compromise on later, because if, if you make an extreme, if you, you know if you take an extreme position, the, the arbitrator is much more likely to go for the other side. Well, when you have two and only two parties, you get winner-take-all politics and loser-lose-all politics. And so the parties have a strong interest in creating platforms that are more like last best offer arbitration and less like um, regular arbitration where people have much more, much stronger incentives to misrepresent their positions so as to be able to negotiate later. Because in two-party competition, you know that any voters you leave on the table, the other side's likely to get. And those last marginal voters that you leave on the table might be the difference between winning everything and losing everything. And this illustrates the, the other point Francis was making, that you want parties that have an incentive to put together a broad program that um, makes it possible to get all, not just your core supporters, but as many of those people that you might otherwise leave on the table that might be the difference between defeat and victory. So that's the sense in which why two big parties, or at least pre-election coalitions of parties, are better than multiple parties. Now let me talk a little bit about strong parties. The idea of a strong party is, is reaching for metaphors, a party that operates basically like a team. A party that is where everybody's pulling in the same direction and trying to get to the same destination. And um, that can only be done if everybody is working towards the same goal. Now, 
parties um, uh, exist in very diverse countries, and if you're going to have two parties, you're going to, they're going to come from single member district systems like we have in the US and in the UK. But the parties in the US are much weaker um, because the, there's, there's many factors in the US that interrupt this idea of functioning as a team. One most obvious candidate is primaries. Um, primaries essentially take the power away from the party leadership in determining who is going to represent constituencies. And what you see in primaries is extremely low turnout. Low turnout sometimes in, in the, the teens, in um, the, even the low teens sometimes. And the people who tend to turn out often are on the extremes of the parties. And so, for instance, in the last presidential election, those la the last dozen to 15 primaries that Donald Trump won in the Republican Party had turnouts of 11, 12, 13 percent, sometimes less. So the net effect of this was that um, five percent of the U.S. electorate actually selected Donald Trump, and the Republican Party couldn't stop him from being the candidate. In, in congressional races, we've had primaries for, half a, for more than a century now. Um, and it has the same effect in that what you have to do to satisfy your primary voters is not the same thing as what you have to do to put together a strong governing coalition, precisely because the primary voters tend to come from the fringes of the parties. And so even though primaries were introduced by the progressives in response to a very corrupt era um, as, as a way of reasserting popular control on politics, actually they, they have the opposite effect because you, we talk about gridlock of the in, inability of leaderships to put together programs that, that they can actually govern with. Primaries reinforce that. I'll just mention one other example and then we should open it up, I think. Um, uh, I said that Britain has much stronger and more disciplined parties than we do, and that has historically has certainly been true, but they have by no means been immune. So one of the things that's happened in Britain, um, for example, in the last uh, 15 years or so, is they've moved from the parliamentary party selecting the leadership to direct election of the party leaders by the members of the party, uh, who again are the grassroots and often well to the left in the Labour Party of the Labour Party median voter and to the right in the Conservative Party of the Conservative Party's median voter. And so you can get the sort of anomaly we saw in 2016 where the parliamentary Labour Party had a vote of no confidence in Jeremy Corbyn by 172 to 40. And three months later, the membership of the Labour Party re-elected Jeremy Corbyn by a, a margin of, uh, by 62% of the vote. Now you imagine Corbyn trying to govern uh, with the parliamentary Labour Party when he, everything he stands for uh, are things on which they cannot run and win in their districts. So this has greatly undermined the capacity of the Labour Party to actually govern if it stumbles into office, which, which it might do. So the, the, the British are, are not immune from this either. And uh, we, we talk a lot in, in the US about how presidentialism undermines the strength of parties in, in Congress, and that's true. Um, precisely because the president has a different mandate often from congressional members uh, of his or her own party, his uh, uh, until now, maybe one day hers, we hope. Um, and I'll just close with this thought, it wasn't always that way and it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, in 1808, James Monroe challenged uh, James Madison for the nomination of the Democratic Republicans as they were then called. And the way it was resolved was to create what was called a congressional caucus, which was essentially the, the like having the parliamentary party select its leader. And that was, it was basically the members of Congress uh, that selected the, who the presidential candidate was going to be. 
And that system remained in place until 1828. And that, that's, from the point of view of a reform, would make much more sense than what's being called for uh, by many places, because, by many people, because it would make the, uh, it would make the parties more like parliamentary parties if the leadership in Congress was selecting the presidential candidates. Why don't I stop there and you all can tell us why we're wrong. <laughs> Are there questions? Um, I have a question. Um, can we generalize from the Brexit experience? Uh, how does the weakness of parties relate to worldwide rise, rise of populism generally? Um, well, Brexit certainly is a good example of what happens when there is this desire to handle the issue ourselves. That is, voters not trusting parties to manage this, we will do this in a popular referendum. Had the British Parliament voted, we all know that Brexit would not have been voted up in the British Parliament. Um, so that's an example of do-it-yourself politics gone wrong. In other parts of the world, are you thinking about Viktor Orban and uh, Erdogan? Do you have anything in mind particularly? Um, um, well, Ian mentioned the German uh, okay. yes. parliamentary elections. Uh, well, so the German case that Ian just mentioned um, was the result of great frustration by the Social Democrats in entering another coalition with Angela Merkel's CDU, CSU, Conservative Union. And in response, the Social Democrats put lots of restrictions on their ministers in negotiating with Merkel, which makes it even harder to come up with a compromise. And, uh, you know, this has happened in. Uh, Belgium and Netherlands and recently in Japan there's also been change of rules of selection of the president of the Liberal Democratic Party restoring democracy in the party by giving members the ability to choose their leader but what happens then is that it puts a lot of power in the hands of local mobilizers in the case of Japan, it's overwhelmingly the rural people who have a strong interest in blocking, uh, let's say, move towards free trade. And so it's going to hamper Abe in this next administration um, in negotiating with foreign countries. Let me add one point about Brexit and one about Germany to what Francis just said. The thing that people don't know about Brexit is that Britain had never had a referendum until 1965. And the first referendum was call, uh, called by Harold Wilson, the Labour Prime Minister, um, on the issue of Europe. And he did it in order to avoid managing conflict within the Labour Party, um, in, in, in order to avoid doing the hard work of discounting everything by everything else and forcing those kind of compromises within the party. He thought, no, I can punt on this, call a referendum, and it, it lets me off the hook. Br the British voters voted two to one in favor of Europe at that time, and, and Wilson said, great, this has taken it off the table forever. Um, but of course it didn't, because for the reason Francis gave, when people can vote piecemeal uh, on issues without discounting them by the, the cost for every other issue, they make unrealistic decisions. It's sort of like a, a small child just eating as much candy as they want without thinking about the stomach ache and the doctor and so on later. Um, so it's actually uh, started on Europe uh, as a way of avoiding exactly the kind of conflict it's produced. Um, on Germany, I would just say that uh, the, the the, the decentralizing ethos hasn't left them alone either. 
Part of the reason the SPD has immobilized Merkel's government is that they too have gone to this direct election of leadership and the 450,000 members actually had to approve the coalition agreement that, that the SPD made with Merkel. And so by the end of it, she had given uh, six ministries to the SPD, including the finance ministry. She has to give three ministries to the CSU, um, and uh, they have very right-wing views about uh, refugees and immigration. She's left with five ministries, not including the finance ministry. If you want it, you think we have, um, you think we have gridlock. It, she, it, you know, we don't have time to go into the chapter and verse of it now, but she's finding it, it almost impossible to govern. There's cliffhanger after cliffhanger where the coalition threatens to fall apart. And it's again because of this decentralization Germany used to have stronger parties, but they too are now being weakened by this, this call for more democracy. So in essence, she has to assemble a new coalition on every issue. And she has to live with the possibility that um, one of, that the, that the coalition partners will, will balk. Uh, if this, the CSU, which is basically almost the same party, was threatening to bring down the government over um, the refugee policy and, and the SPD was recently threatening to do it over the appointment of a minister. So she, she's sort of, you know, being held in equipoise um, uh, by the need to maintain this coalition. Mark. So this you have to yell at us. Yeah, there seems to be powerful forces going the other way. Like I think the Democratic Party is trying to get rid of their superdelegates because they're incredibly Trump was an outsider candidate. So what would you say to those parties to your earlier comment? How do we get their opinion? What steps would they take? Well, that's exactly what we're talking about. It's a democratizing reform with unintended consequences. By immobilizing the superdelegates, we're throwing the decision to the more extreme positions making it harder to choose a candidate who will win. Right, Mark? Well, right, but I think our current candidate supporters felt shortchanged by the process. That's exactly. And I think, and maybe I'm wrong, but I think the Democratic Party was moving away from that because it was viewed as being sort of undemocratic. That's exactly right. That's the origin. And we're symp sympathetic <coughs> substantively with many of the, the concerns that our point is that beware what you wish for because you may get something very different which is a candidate who can't win. So to, to I just supplement that a little bit. What I would say about superdelegates is that they, they're a really bad band-aid on, on a big problem. So you know the, the superdelegates were a response to the fact that the reforms of after 1968 which after the Chicago Convention and all of that, uh, democratized the control of the party, which produced McGovern, who lost 49 states, which produced you know, Kennedy's insurgency against Jimmy Carter, which damaged him. Uh, you know, perhaps was the difference between winning and losing in 1980, we'll never know. But then that produced a reaction, uh, those sorts of developments. Um, but but the, real, the real problem is the decentralized con control in the first place. As I say, it would be much better if the presidential candidates were selected by the congressional parties. Uh, uh, and the superdelegates are... Right? That will never happen. It, oh. wouldn't, it, it wouldn't happen <laughs> now. But there, there are other things one could do. For example, um, we, we'll, we'll never get rid of primaries. They've been there for a century in, the, in Congress and, and for decades in the presidential system of consequence. But one could imagine a reform where, where it was held that in the event that the, the primary turnout is not, say, 75% of the general election turnout in the previous election, then they'll be discounted and some other body within the party, whether it's superdelegates or the congressional leadership or somebody else. Because most people don't realize that primary turnout is so low. So if you set some requirement of that general sort, it would turn up the spotlight 
Um, for instance, the, 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 the primary in New York that's got, gotten so much attention, what's the 12th, 14th district, 12th district, um, which produced a candidate, uh, you know, self-styled yeah, yeah. Self, yeah. self yes. socialist. The, the, primary, the turnout in that primary was 11.9%. You know, so it's not, you know, now she might survive anyway because it's a heavily, heavily, heavily democratic district. But assuming she does survive, um, you, you've got to think about a, a congressional democratic leadership that has, you know, representatives from Ohio and Indiana and, um, you know, California trying to put together a government that's going to be a team with people that far uh, to the left. So everybody, you know, cheers the, the, the kumbaya moment when she gets elected in the primary, but what they're missing is this, this is contributing to the fragmentation within, within the parties that makes it impossible for them to govern, which then makes people scream about the, the dysfunction in Washington and demand even more. Uh, if I could just control. say one other thing that's related to what we can do, this is a moment in which everybody understands the problem of gerrymandered districts. They're uncompetitive. And while the attention is on that, it would be good to notice that parties do much better when districts are heterogeneous so that those people elected from the district look more like each other. That is, rather than have very geographically and identity-wise distinct districts to have large heterogeneous districts that look like the national median voter, that is a situation in which you're much more likely to get strong parties because they're going to cohere around a set of principles that they can all see need to go forward. I just want to interject one question, then we have a couple of uh, others. Um, in your American interest piece, um, you use the phrase too much democracy in the wrong places, um, which you compare to, uh, to, to, to bloodletting as a folk remedy that, that ultimately uh, kills the patient. Um, George Washington, nonetheless. Killed George no, Washington, no, yes. No, no, no. Also Nikolai Gogol, but that's beside the point. Um, and, and you describe this as bottom up decision making. Um, is there a distinction? Because the, 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 the objection to, you know, to, to, to your argument will be, well, you know, that's democracy. The people have to, to speak. Is there a distinction between that sort of bottom-up decision-making and structures that actually reflect the will of the people? We're saying that parties are the way to hold government accountable to things that are good for lots of people over the long run, rather than falling prey to very powerfully mobilized smaller groups that then bargain with one another and then what you get is a pastiche but then the, the resemblance to the people becomes very attenuated through that process. Um, yes, the... Uh, so just a moment ago you brought up coherency and I was wondering what you think the best way is for the parties to come up with that sellable bundle how do they come up with it? Yeah, so we're really talking about legislative parties, which is why in a presidential system it's hard because you've got two heads to the, you know, actually many heads to this hydra, which is why the American system is, is challenging. But um, in 1950, the American Political Science Association had a committee to think about this very problem, and they called their report Return to Responsible Parties, John, I don't know if you, John Donatich came up with our title, and I don't know if you knew that you were quoting E.E. E. Schatzneider, uh, who was a you know, professor of American politics at that time, and they recommended that there be stronger coordination among the legislative party and the executive so that they're not pulling against each other, but they're pulling, as Ian says, as part of a team. And 
it's a hard thing to do in our system. Parliamentary systems really are set up better to do that. Uh, but there, there could be, even within the American constitutional framework, uh, ways to improve on that. Let me just add something to that uh, um, point, which is, if you think about the logic of parliamentary systems, not that we're going to create one, but what we want to try and approximate, the, the back benches delegate a lot of authority to the front benches to come up with the platform that you're talking about because they know that the front benches are looking across all the constituencies and trying to make sure, as I said earlier, that they don't leave any more votes on the table than they have to because it's the difference between winning everything and losing everything. So, so the back benches have a, an have uh, an interest in delegating that authority to the front benches, but only on condition that they deliver. So they give them enough rope to hang themselves, right? You wouldn't get a situation in a parliamentary system where, like Nancy Pelosi has led the de Democrats to four successive defeats, and she's still there. That couldn't happen in a, they, the back benches would have no reason to uh, keep giving authority to somebody who couldn't deliver victory, because that, that's, what they, that's the one thing they have to get. Now, she's not held accountable because uh, responsibilities diffuse, people blame the president, um, things are different in off-year elections, um, all kinds of interest groups. She raises groups. money. <laughs> she raises money, and they need money. She's the best fundraiser of all time, people say. So she's she's protected even though she's an ineffective leader. And that's what we, that's what we mean by, by weak parties. So really, you know, coming up with reforms that uh, militate against that feature of the system is what we're looking for. Um, this gentleman in the black sweater, and I'll go to the people on the other side. There was somebody here. Um, I am the You gotta yell. Um, you spoke very eloquently about the, the slightly counterintuitive solution that you're proposing. My, my question would be about, if you can say a bit more about your interpretation of the problem that you're trying to solve. So the, the voter discontent, the, the discontent of the citizenry, um, can you say something about why that's boiled up so much recently? If you think it's the same in the US as it is in the UK, um, just yeah, your interpretation of the problem to which you're proposing that solution. Well, it's not new. You know, the progressives had a whole raft of popularizing reforms because of corrupt machine politics. So anything can prompt this blaming of parties. And we're just sounding the alarm against a simplistic view of parties that doesn't take into account the problem of weak parties. We need stronger parties that can solve problems, not weaker ones that will cede accountability. Uh, Another way of putting it is, life's about trade-offs. There's no perfect solution to anything. And there's actually a trade-off between popular participation and accountable government. And we're, we're putting a thumb on the scale for accountable governments. We, we want to move towards a world in which the, the politicians that get elected are actually ha held accountable for the policies that they were elected to implement. And uh, a lot of participation at all levels essentially immobilizes them and makes that and, 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 and militates against that. Could I just say one other thing, Max, because you know, we really admire European success in the post-war period. Europe was far better at the United, than the United States at redistributing income and having a decent economy while also um, having elements of, of welfare and, and equality. And what we are observing now is a fragmentation on the left disproportionately because of the decline of industrial jobs and the unions that were in lockstep with social democratic parties. And as that happens, as the left fragments, we're seeing in Europe the same kind of immobilism that comes with a system like the American one where you have checks and balances. So Europe is not immune to this problem 
of fragmented political authority. So Europe needs to figure out how they're going to deal with this problem. In Sweden, the right, the parties on the right, have been very successful in forming a coalition of parties. And in fact, they've just thrown out Lufen, the prime minister uh, of the Social Democrats. So there is a way for parties to form pre-election coalitions to help them function more like a team that can be accountable. But they, they're going to have to do something like that. Proportional representation is a whole set of challenges of its own. Um, the lady. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Uh, in terms of getting political parties to function more like teams and spend more time addressing complex issues, like building a consensus within the party itself, um, is there any way um, to get you know, because campaign finance reform could be years away. But is there any way to get parties themselves to self-police themselves, to have more discipline? Uh, number one, in terms of the number of candidates. Like for, I'm giving an example. In New York City, New York State, there's a race for a congressional seat, I think for New York City. And I think there's about six Democratic Party candidates. The front runner has a war chest of $3.5 million. He's a newcomer. The other five are people who have roots in the community, have worked for a you know, very, very long time. And you know, I don't know how, I mean, I, you know, that's not going to help the party cohere. No. You know, people are going <laughs> to feel you know, that the person with the, the basically the $3.5 million candidate could steal the whole show. And by the way, he's also run, he also wants to run simultaneously for attorney general. So, mm -hmm. so and the other thing is, what about limiting, you know, the time spent on campaigns? Because it just costs tons of money, and then people don't really have time to address complex issues, uh, debate issues, so that you know, you have like a party that spends 90% of this time fundraising. Yes. Well, part of the reason money is such a big deal in American politics is exactly because parties are weak. So a member of a party can't campaign on the basis of a platform. What is the platform? They're running against one another in the same party. So they need to cultivate individual support. Countries that have strong parties have far less money floating around in campaign processes. Can the parties discipline themselves? No, but voters can punish and reward really more by setting up incentive structures. For example, um, you know, districting in such a way as to force them to reach a wider audience, or as Ian was saying, uh, make these primaries really more about the average voter and not extreme voters. What else would you On say? On districting, I would just add, so um, there has been a move in a number of states away from having the state legislatures do the districting every 10 years after the census, which, you know, whoever's put, whichever party is controlling the state uh, legislature then has the incentive uh, to try and gerrymander to their own advantage. But if you look at, at the most of the states that have gone to so-called independent commissions, most of them are actually bipartisan commissions. They're not independent commissions. Um, they're not. They're not uh, civil servants or technocrats doing it. They have com so many Democrats, so many Republicans. And the danger with that is that they'll gerrymander to carve up the state. Partisan gerrymandering, so-called, which the Supreme Court has, has said, well, in principle, yes, we would we'd be willing to strike down partisan gerrymandering if it gets too extreme, but they've never actually done it. And they haven't, they haven't uh, taken the acts to agreements among parties to divide up states. And of course, if you do that, you get states full of safe seats where all the elections are really the intra-party competitions in the primary. Um, so what you really need is um, not 
bipartisan commissions, but nonpartisan commissions. Well, the system in the UK, which is, I think, good on this front, is the independent commission does the redistricting, and then parliament can vote it up or down, but they can't change it. Um, you need some mechanism of, of, of that sort, and the, and the mandate to the districters should be to draw districts that are going to be competitive between parties. Um, because that's what you, you really want to gerrymander for inter-party competition. Our, our bumper sticker is competition between parties is good, competition within parties is bad. Can you talk louder? If there's only one referendum, we decide on this issue, no referendum, and then we all go attack this, or we all need to move the money, or things like that. But there's a system which is maybe a little bit opposite to your seamless like in Switzerland, where you have to be there a referendum every couple of months on certain issues. Where everybody has to vote, and also where the parties submit lists of the candidates, but you are allowed to change these lists and kind of um, interfere with them directly. Well, the intra-party, so I don't know if everybody heard that, but some countries that have proportional representation, which is an electoral system where the parties get the number of seats proportional to the votes they get, but the voter only sees a list. And so this conduces to strong parties. The party selects the list. But in some countries, voters have the opportunity to tick names of people they want from any place on the list. And um, this sounds great in principle, but it's exactly the kind of democratizing reform we think weakens parties. It makes it a lot harder for the party to say, no, we're not talking about individuals here. We're talking about these ideas that we all agree to. And the people on this list all are pulling in that same direction. When you have the opportunity to rise up the list, you know, maybe even from below the point where you wouldn't get elected, you have an incentive to do something a little different. Go to voters and say, the party is good, I agree with the party, but I will also do these other things. So we, um, we appreciate the fact that in, in Sweden, for example, they are still trying very hard not to go that path, despite the fact that there is a lot of pressure. There's always pressure on parties to open up the list in that way. And we think it's better for them not to. Um, you also mentioned well, referendum. You okay, you go ahead. Well, so Switzerland, you know, is this remarkably functional place, despite rules that we don't think should work very well. <laughs> so that's why we're saying, you, you do it, you do it. Uh, we, we haven't quite figured that one out. Um, I would say there was a, um, Joanne, you probably know this. It's a famous article by Jens Heinmuller on a referendum that was very uh, anti-immigrant. Uh, and so that's the problem with referendums and kind of populist seeding of territory, you know, policy territory, you get these emotional Yahoo kinds of responses from the voters. And in this case, in this particular case, the Constitutional Court, I believe it was, am I right, Juan? Yeah, um, overruled the results of that referendum on behalf of the interests of the whole country because they actually need those immigrants. You know, Switzerland needs and has benefited enormously from a diversity of population. So just to say that both of those institutions are dangerous, thin ice. I would just add a couple of points about Switzerland. Um, it, it has, it is not, you know, it is a system in which, first of all, it's a pretty small country, and I think that, that how scalable it is is a, is a real question. 
You know, and secondly, it's not just the anti-immigrant stuff, but this is a country that managed to avoid giving women the vote until 1973. One, but yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a downside to <laughs> empowering um, uh, intense groups. Yeah. Uh, John. Yeah. Um, going back to your example of the British Labour Party. Of what? Labour Party. The British Party. Labour Party Corbyn. strong party that used to be. I mean, so much of its strength was vicarious. It was really the borrowed strength of, of a very dense delivery of organizations outside it. So a typical Labour Party goes to be a member of the trade union, um, and the football club, and drink at the local club, all of which were associated with Labour, you know, which an association that grew up over a long time. <coughs> and all of that was washed away in the industrialization. Those associations and people connected through them were gone. And, and this moved much, much later to have members um, directly vote was really an attempt to, to reconnect the base with the Stelter period. It was an attempt to retreat something that was gone. Um, and so my question is, to what extent is that generalizable? To what extent is party strength uh, much more than a narrow political domain, but also a social domain, also about acquiring hegemony in life or acquiring a presence in life? I mean, is that a universal condition of party strength? Um, and if so, building the strong parties is a pretty comprehensive process. So I, I'd say two things about this. We are here focusing on what difference the, the rules governing the organization, operation of parties and elections, what role that plays. We're not saying it's the whole story. And clearly, you know, there are two enormous facts that are governing the political economy and politics uh, in all countries over the last 35, 40 years. One is the worldwide collapse of communism, and the other is the collapse uh, of organized labor and the left. And so that, that, that is playing, those two things are playing themselves out in all political systems. And in, you can see this by comparing Britain with Europe, Britain and the US with Europe. In Britain and the US, the collapse of the union movement eventually forced the sort of new labor and uh, the new Democrats and the, the kind of love affair with Wall Street and all that in these parties, which then alienated some of the people you're talking about. And in Europe, as Francis said, we've seen this now, this fragmentation of the left into multiple parties, not just the Greens, but you know, left, uh, old social democrats, and then the far left, and some are flipping over to the sort of AFD on the far right. Um, so all of these systems are coping with the, with the absence of a serious socialist alternative uh, because of the disappearance of communism and the concomitant collapse of the left and of trade supported by a union movement that is, is playing itself out differently in different ways. So what, you know, you could say, well, these are the giant forces shaping everything. Uh, and what we're talking about is to some degree on the margin. Uh, I think there's some truth to that, but it's still not a trivial margin, is what I would say. And you, you have to work, at the, work in, in the areas you can work. And we're just saying, First of all, don't make it even worse. <laughs> and then think about things that might push in the other direction. I don't know what you would add to that. Doug. Uh, so I think we can all agree that responsible parties, mindful of long-term fiscal planning, would be a good thing. And that Proposition 13 was a good example of the initiative process leading to short-term fiscal thinking with bad long-term results. But I don't think the most significant problems that we have right now are a result in this country of insufficiently strong parties or too much democratization. In fact, the two parties are, by historical standards, remarkably ideologically coherent right now. And with the Republican Party controlling all three branches of government, they haven't been lacking in strength. But in terms of their long-term fiscal policy making, they've absolutely been lacking in responsibility in terms of passing tax cuts that will create deficits until kingdom income, as things currently stand. Um, 
And in terms of getting there from here, isn't uh, the initiative process and other um, democratic means, aren't those the best way we have of countering, gerrymandering, that intend to encourage Republican legislators, legislators uh, to pay more attention to ideological fealty than to median vote voters? Um, even if these, even if these uh, initiative processes uh, produce commissions that don't, um, that aren't perfectly nonpartisan. They'll be better than cracking and stacking that we have with present gerrymandering. Um, and it seems like, and again, um, democratization, the democratic means can also do things like restore voting rights to, to felons, as is uh, an effort being made right now in, in Florida. So aren't these the means that we have right now? Well, you've said two separate things. The first thing you said was the parties are internally coherent. Uh, only if you look at roll call votes on things that they know are not going to pass. They're actually internally very incoherent. Uh, and so how do we strengthen parties? That is a very hard uh, question, but um, we think that if voters appreciate the problem, they're more likely to put pressure and put uh, out of office the politicians associated with refusing to budge on that. So that has to come from a, a better informed electorate. Uh, Could I, I just add one thing yeah. to that? The parties look more coherent than they are, as Francis said, partly because of roll call votes and partly because they they campaign on more ideologically uh, distinct platforms than they used to do. But the, uh, a political scientist at the University of Maryland, Francis Lee, has done the best work on this. If you look at what parties actually enact, um, the, the, they're no more able to enact partisan agendas than they were in the 1970s. Uh, on virtually all legislation, including major legislation, they have to get the support of at least at least one of the other the, the other party in at least one of the houses, and um, so something like the tax cut is actually uh, an, a big outlier. Very little legislation passes in that way, or Obamacare is a big outlier. And usually, when we have a whole chapter about Obamacare, because when you look at the rents that were extracted by interest groups to get Obamacare through Congress. They're enormous, from the pharmaceuticals, from the insurance companies, uh, from all these various other groups that all got their pound of flesh out of the belt as a condition for passage. Very unlike the NHS uh, that was passed in Britain in, in 1947. Um, so the, the more typical case is that, the, say, the Republicans could vote 67 times or whatever it was to repeal Obamacare when they knew Obama would veto it or it wouldn't get through the Senate or whatever. It was just position taking. But when it actually came to repealing it, they couldn't do it. Um, and so that's the much more typical case, despite all the, the wind and fury of partisanship. Um, most actual governing is as bipartisan as it ever was, which this system pretty much forces. We're out of time, but we're happy to chat afterwards up here, and some of you... I just want to ask one last question. Oh, you do? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I'd add that, you know, if, if, when, when we talk about the uh, strength of parties, um, you know, one... one uh, quick measure of this is simply the fact that the word primary is now a verb. Um, when, when you look at you know, who individual representatives and senators are answerable to, it's not the party leadership anymore. They're terrified of being primary. And that's really what determines their vote much more than what the leaders say. And that, to me, is an indication that the apparent strength of parties in, in uh, ideological coherence and, and the vast amounts of money they have really doesn't translate into effective governance. Um, my question has to do with, uh, with minorities. Um, how are powerful parties an answer to protecting vulnerable minorities? And why is working within a party a better strategy 
then forming a third party? So this is a, a very great concern. And our uh, argument is that in the current system, minorities are pretty much ignored because their vote can be counted on. And to have diverse districts in which both parties have to go after everybody would improve the lot in terms of policy outcomes of minorities over the system that we have now. I would just add to that. We have a whole chapter about minorities, so obviously you should go to a good book store near you and, <laughs> and, and buy the book and read the chapter about minorities. But, you know, again, we've gone in the wrong direction because majority minority districts get better so-called descriptive representation, more minorities into Congress. Uh, and that's happened uh, since the 1970s. But look at the legislative gains. What major legislation helping minority interests has passed since the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act? Nothing. So, you know, what, you look at the output side of the equation um, and ask yourself, how is this really serving the interests of minorities? And as for the, the costs of majority minority districts, as I said, read chapter three. <laughs> Please, thank you. Uh, thank uh, Ian and Francis um, for a wonderful discussion. I hope. Uh, thank you.